So we'll start with punishment one, tattooing. You may have seen our video, the top 10 messed up punishments from the Tokugawa era, in which case tattoos as punishment may sound familiar. While Japan and China were on different wavelengths and doing their own things, this is something they had in common for criminals. Although tattooing has been known in China for centuries, it has been in the most part an uncommon practice outside of their indigenous peoples. Throughout Chinese history, tattooing has been seen as a defamation of the body, something undesirable, and this originates likely with the penal tattooing as one of the five capital punishments in ancient China. The first, and considered the lightest of the five punishments, had criminals' upper cheeks or forehead or other visible parts of the body tatted up. It was usually words that described their misdemeanors or the location of their exile or name of their hard labor camp. These tattoos are obviously permanent and very visibly marked out their bearers as ex-criminals for life. Even should the criminal ever return from exile, the tattoo would mark them as what they were. The Kinlaw Code covered so many offenses that common people frequently did not realize they had committed a crime until they'd been arrested. So you really could be just minding your business one day and boom, face tat the next. Next is amputations. So after tattoos, the next was rhinotomy, aka the snip snip of a criminal's nose. Like tattooing, it left the victim scarred for life. But because sharp items and blood were involved, rhinotomy and the next two penalties following after often resulted in death, even if not their intention, just due to things like bleeding out or infections. Then level three is amputation of feet, aka you. Modern day scientists have been examining a skeleton that was found from 3,000 years ago where the foot of a woman was cut off as punishment for committing a criminal act. Various clues hint that the woman's foot was cut off as a U. Her bones show no signs of any disease that could have made such an amputation necessary, and it seems that the injury was roughly made, rather than with the precision of a medical amputation. There were variations in punishments in different periods where the choice of foot removed depended on the severity of the crimes committed. Amputation of the right foot for a very serious crime, and the left for lighter offenses. It would seem that the woman, who was determined to be in her early 30s when she died, had committed the former. There is extensive historical evidence of the practice of the third punishment, such as documents of a Chinese official in the millennium BC complaining about the demand to find special shoes for their amputee people. Remove the reproductives, called gong, the permanent removal of a person's reproductive function. Male victims of this punishment were castrated, losing the member as well as their boys. A very famous casualty was Sima Qian, an emasculated father of traditional Chinese history writing. Gong punishments for female victims were harder as in the older times they didn't really know what was going on all up in there or how to access it. So it might have involved pounding a woman's abdomen with a stout stick to introduce some kind of damage to the womb. Call that waka womb I guess? But um, no? No, all right. Then the final in the code, the last of the five punishments was death, obviously. However, there were different variations of death, from simple strangulation or decapitation to boiling or grilling a person alive and making literal mincemeat out of a person's flesh and then salting it. They got gorgeous with it, guys. The cruelty was deliberate and designed to cause maximum pain to the victims and their families, as well as to shock and deter others from committing similar crimes. A criminal might be sentenced to death by strangulation if left punitive or decapitation if more punitive. Strangulation was actually prescribed sentence for lesser crimes, lodging an accusation against one's parents or grandparents, scheming to kidnap a person and sell them, opening a coffin while desecrating a tomb. Decapitation was a method of execution prescribed for more serious crimes such as treason or sedition. Despite a great discomfort involved, most of the Chinese people actually preferred strangulation to decapitation in the ancient times, and this is the result of the traditional belief that the body is a gift from the parents and that it is therefore disrespectful to one's ancestors to die without returning one's body to the grave intact. Executions were usually carried out at 11.30 a.m. On the day of the execution, the convict would be carted from the jail cell to the execution grounds. The cart stopped at a wine shop named the Broken Bowl on the east side of the Zuanwu Gate, where the convict would be offered a bowl of rice wine. The bowl would be smashed after it was drunk, opa, and then her heads chopped off and promptly sent to the emperor.
Now finished with the five official punishments, let's check out some other whores, like the kangu, a type of large wooden collar placed around the necks of offenders, which could weigh differently depending on the severity of their crimes. Speaking of which, the Chinese Empire really said, and we have the receipts for it too, guys, as the criminal's past crimes would be attached to the wooden collar most of the time for the public to see, grocery list style. The kangu also restricted a person's movements, so it was common for people wearing kangus to start starved to death as they were unable to feed themselves and sometimes not even move from one place. If people were generous enough to offer food to the roadside kangu wearers, they could also see the list of their crimes and determine based off of that if they deserved their generosity at all. After all, it was a device used for public humiliation and corporal punishment. Imagine seeing someone you've beefed with forever pop up one day on the street corner wearing one of these. You can just walk up and read everything they did wrong, just attached to them. That's satisfaction for a grudge Older man. Number five, Hera and Heracles. Bless my soul, Herc was on a roll, and Hera, the queen of gods, was extremely jealous of that. All those other women in her husband's life, Zeus's consorts, and Hera hated the kids that came along with the adultery. One of them being, of course, Heracles, who puts the glad in gladiator, Hercules. Yeah, that's the same dude. I was a 90s kid. As the story goes, Hera caused Hercules so much trouble that he was actually driven mad on one occasion. According to Homer, just before Hercules was born, Zeus announced a prophecy that would make Hercules the ruler of the heavens in his place when the time came. Hera didn't like that so much. She kind of pushed the birth thing a little bit. Hera also made Herc crazy. A little bit of roid rage, you know? In a blind rage one night, he kills his wife and son under the rage spell of Hera. Part of this punishment was that the insanity was just temporary, so when he came to and realized that he John Wicked everyone, yeah, she had won. In sadness, he smashed about 12 labors and got himself back on track. Talk about zero to hero. Number four, Arachne and Athena. Okay, so a little hex here, a little labors there. The wrath of the gods is pretty tame so far. Well, was. And then there's the story of Arachne. Ovid recounts the very talented mortal Arachne, daughter of Idmon, challenged Athena, goddess of wisdom and crafts, to a weaving contest. Yeah, you don't challenge the goats to what make them great, you know? When Athena could find no flaws or errors in the tapestry, she was pretty pissed. When Athena saw that Arachne had not only insulted the gods in what she had drawn, but done so with a work far more beautiful than Athena's own art, she was enraged. She ripped Arachne's work to shreds, and terrified of what comes next, Arachne took her own life. Athena brought her back to life, cursing her after a little sprinkle of Hecate's herb, an ancient poison. Arachne's hair started falling out, and then her nose fell off, and then her fingers, as her whole body started slowly turning into a giant spider. Uh? And this is apparently now why we have spiders. Yeah, thanks to this epic weave off. Number three. Hera and Lamia. Lamia was a beautiful Libyan queen and enter Zeus stage right. Of course, loved by Zeus. Yeah, basically through no fault of her own, she got the wrath of Hera upon herself. This dude's commitment skills leads these people to get in a line of fire with some nasty curses. Hera cursed this lady hard. Every time she gave birth to a child, Hera either murdered it or made her eat it, regardless if it was Zeus's or not. Hera was like, Nah, never again. Now eat it. All of them. Even babies that weren't hers. Basically every night Lamia would ravenously make her way village to village eating mother's babies. That's horrible. She swore to bereave all mothers of their children just as she had been once by Hera. Trying to help of course, Zeus gave her removable eyes so that she was blind but harmless in the day. But after she popped those bad boys in, feeding time. Hera's mean man. Number two. Poseidon and Pasiphae. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more into like disturbing graphic land with some of the more cruel things here. What started out as a rumor that some people were kind of smelly is turning into like eternities of pain and suffering and stuff. Pasiphae was a queen of Crete and often regarded as the goddess of witchcraft and sorcery. The daughter of Helios and the ocean nymph Perse, Pasiphae is notable as the mother of the Minotaur. You'll see why. She conceived the Minotaur after mating with the Cretan bull. Minos was required to sacrifice the fairest bull to Poseidon each year. One year, Minos, king, refused to sacrifice his most beautiful strong bull and sacrificed an inferior weak bull instead. Dude, don't 
with the gods. As punishment, of course, Poseidon then cursed his wife Pasiphae to fall head over heels obsession lust for this beautiful giant prized bull. And many months later, Pasiphae gave birth to a half human, half bull creature famously known as the Minotaur. The curse was sent out as a reminder to her husband Minos, quality over quantity kind of deal. That's heartbreaking. For her, of course. Her husband's cheap, so she has to birth a bull. It's not really fair, I'd say. And coming in at number one, Prometheus and Zeus. And our number one spot, of course, must go to the god of gods himself. He can be pretty shady. Cheating on all his lovers, fighting with his old man and his kids. He's a little unpredictable at times. This one, ramping up the cruelty, we have Prometheus. He was our guy. This demigod loved us and stole fire for us. He fought on our behalf. He led the Titans into a trap, securing power amongst the gods again. He was everybody's friend, besides Zeus. Yeah, Zeus didn't like the tricks and the new plans and all the attention he was getting. So Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining the Titan God to a rock with the might of Zeus himself. And then, worst part of course, having an eagle day in and day out just eat his insides out. Basically just slowly eating him for eternity. He would heal overnight, but then come the AM, breakfast again for eternity. Okay, so a little humanity never hurt anybody except for poor Prometheus. Thank you for the wonderful campfires. We now have s'mores, they taste great. But Hercules is coming, buddy. He's gonna come save you. I've seen the last chapter, no spoilers alert. Well, there you have it, folks. 10 times the ancient gods got a little pissed and decided to dish out some justice themselves. I mean, I don't agree with like almost all of these. Turning a woman into a spider because she's a better weaver? Like just admit defeat. Or like Robin Hooding for the good of people, only to be eaten alive every day by a giant bird? I don't know. Eye for an eye, you know? Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particularly violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, Kugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those who had already been punished with exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked, so I mean pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison. Number nine is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favored way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number 8 is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go to punishment for a non violent offender, like a thief a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now usually it came with expulsion, which unlike exile doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to 
them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal reoffended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had a three strikes then you're out system. In 1745, tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards arm tattoo. In 1872, the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number 7, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground on one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not as long hair was cultivated between both sexes so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair until they confessed or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So number 6 is going to make me even more nauseous, it's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish, I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edo was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working, heck it can walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. And Number 5. Sawing. Yeah, sawing. You know, again, another one I don't have to explain too much here, hopefully. Mostly seen in Rome, Spain, and some portions of Asia. It's common. It's a pretty common, straightforward idea. Sawing is. You can imagine this one already, right? We sure hope you can because, well, we can't show it. Of course. This is another straightforward one, unfortunately. Capital punishment at its cruelest. Getting sawed in half. Again, to the public. Yeah, here's a fun one. Here's a fun show. Drive-in movies or sawing? I'm not sure. Here's a fact that some folk don't quite realize. This one sends shivers down my spine. But sometimes the sawing was done from top to bottom, not side to side. It's almost impressive, right? It's like cutting a carrot in half vertically. It's a little awkward. It's rolling around a bit. But you know what? They did it. Somehow your bones and your soul. Mozzatello. Occasionally used by the Papal States for only some of the most, you know, terrible crimes or crimes that were considered bad at the time. Basically, the person who was being taken care of, they would be led to a scaffold that was located again in the public square. Classic. Everyone come on out. Grab your family, your aunts, your uncles. We're watching something today. Classic. This person would be accompanied by a priest and on the scaffold would lie a coffin. How fitting. A coffin and of course a masked executioner who is dressed in all black with the zipper mouth probably, I don't know. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, because I mean, sure, everyone's watching, like, oh yes, of course. And then when that time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Now, sometimes, and hopefully this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would just render them unconscious, which would then lead them to their throat being, you know, you get it. None of these sound great, but this one, it sucks really bad. It's like, hey, you're gonna get hit, and then it might get worse, I don't know. Necklacing. I'm never wearing my necklace ever again. Here we go. Necklacing is a terrifying practice that involves a rubber tire, not a necklace, a rubber tire, and unfortunately, it involves a human being as well. The rubber tire is filled with petrol, which is then put around the victim's chest and arms, and they can't move, and then after that, they are set ablaze. Yeah, you figured that was coming. You think I'm talking about the hills have eyes or something terrible, but no, this was real life. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out what happens next, but this method, sadly, can take up to 20 minutes for somebody to pass away from. Little different than the elephant stuff, you know what I mean? They're just left suffering the whole entire time. This one wasn't too public. Nobody could stick around for this one. Cause you know, 20 minutes, no way. I could barely get through a 10 minute YouTube video. You wanna watch this guy burn for 20 minutes? Good joke, how horrible. Impalement. This was another one that was highly requested by 
you guys. I've heard you comment on this a couple times, so yeah, I'll talk about it. Sure, you weirdos. Impaling, do impaling, long neck, impaling. I'm like, you got it. I hear you, I see you, let's make it happen. Vlad the Third, also known as Vlad the Impaler or something like that. He liked doing a little bit of something like this. This was a popular form of punishment for a very long time, sadly, and was most commonly used as a response to crimes against the state. Although Mr. Vlad, we just mentioned, basically did it to everybody that he didn't like, so I suppose to each their own. Sure. All right, Vlad the Third. Maybe Vlad the Fourth won't do that. Let's hope. Impalement was a method of both torture and obviously execution that involved, well, just slowly driving a stake or a pole or a spear or a big carrot, something pointy or whatever, through a person in order to completely or partially um, perforate their torso. There we go. I sound like a Victorian scientist. You can impale somebody vertically or again horizontally if you want to spice it up. Instead of going this way, you go. Oh, that's really bad. Ducking stools. Medieval times, here we go. If you can do math, you're going for a swim. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century in England and New England. And it was uh, usually a punishment that was reserved for women. Women who uh, could do bed mass. There you go, you're a witch. Have a, have a nice dip. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly things. Back then, whatever that was supposed to mean. And it was ridiculous. Apparently this included things like having an argument with their husband, taking a dip, fighting with the neighbors, you're going for a swim, gossiping and backstabbing, how dare thee, you're going swimming. Whoever made these rules clearly had never met a man or a friend because newsflash, everyone does all those things. I did all those before I even came in here to film, so hopefully I don't get dunked in the river. But basically this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again while a bunch of dudes with no teeth watched and they're like, yeah, that's what you get for being smart. And Talking back with your opinions on International Women's Day. We're posting this one too, eh? How ironic is that? Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take and most of the time your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods. And the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree. My bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them. Maybe it was the same guy. I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this. But when you steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor. There's no battle for land. No fight for property. No bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently, although they sound the same in terms of brutality, and someone's losing their home regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards it can vary. But one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area, hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung, like here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now this of course would upset the cow and it would thrash him about. Now if the man at this point can keep hold of the cow's tail for a specified length of time, why he passed the test of course, so then he was allowed to live on and he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that. But back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could 
Lafella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. You know what I mean? That's simple. Today there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking Age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay, Viking law is done. Go home. Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot-headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments, so as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, one method of punishment in the later Viking age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity. So there are some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know. Either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You don't want another rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's, it's close. Definitely. In Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well, then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. It's horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was Nut, the Danish king of England, back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears, while men were merely chastised. Not even close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who would kill their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point, that sounds terrible. Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, Keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles. Then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. 
Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is untied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. Number 10, Aphrodite and Lemnos. Kicking off this list, we have some pretty tame punishments. Definitely cruel to say the least, but more on the non-lethal side of things, as God's sakes go. Apparently the gods love to be praised. Yeah, they're uh, awesome. <laughs> But sometimes they do some foul stuff. The goddess of beauty herself, Aphrodite, gets pretty pissed when she's not obsessed over. And the women of the Isle of Lemnos were kind of slacking on the prayer department. So she cursed the people of the island with a foul smell. I mean, that's pretty mean. Everybody stinks sometimes in life. You know, it's life. Little Musk never hurt anybody. But apparently the stink was so bad, all their partners left them and they were quite upset, Bruh. which I can understand. It was probably just the equivalent to like the great stink in Europe, you know? Bodies and carcasses on a hot, grease day just heating up the water and stinking it up. Ew. But nope, now it's a curse. Poor women of Lemnos probably get that rep for a while, you know? Stereotypes, they're brutal. I don't like them. Also, a little salt water under the armpits, Boom, easy fix. Number nine, Demeter and Ascalophus. Demeter, goddess of harvest and agriculture, and her hatred for a certain mortal man. No. A, a king, actually. Demeter apparently was out looking for her abducted daughter, Persephone, and was thirsty from running around, naturally. She found a cottage owned by a little old lady named Hecuba, asking to wet her whistle and started drinking some barley juice. Thirsty as all Poseidon, she was chugging from all the running around. The son of the woman, just a little kid, basically was like, Thirsty much? <laughs> yeah, you don't mock a god, little man. She threw her drink in his face and turned him immediately into a spotted newt. <laughs> You're done. You're done. <laughs> okay, couple things here. Little excessive, I think. I mean, <laughs> what do I know? I guess you shouldn't talk shit, kid, you know? Talk shit, get turned into a newt. That's the saying, isn't it? Number eight, Demeter and Erisithen. Erisithen of Thessaly ordered all of the trees of the sacred grove of Demeter to be cut down. Yeah, that's a big mistake right there. Industrial logging. One huge oak was covered with beautiful wreaths, a symbol of every prayer Demeter had ever granted, and so the men refused to cut it down. Every other one, of course, yeah, let's go get that rustic log cabin look. Erisithen needed more wood, so he himself grabbed an axe and went out and cut down that last tree. He was cursed by a nymph, naturally, whose prayer had been heard by Demeter herself. Long story short, she was like, you wanna build and eat? No problem. Gave him the munchies of a lifetime. Non-stop hunger, an insatiable hunger. Guy ate everything in sight. He was so hungry, Guy started eating himself. Yeah, all of him. Look, I've been hungry and picked something off the floor, five second rule, no problem but I've never garlic and buttered my own fingers. But uh, greed is greed, firm but fair. Number seven, Sisyphus and Hades. Sisyphus was the first king of Ephra, a cruel king. He killed guests and travelers in his palace, which was a violation of guest obligations, which fell under Zeus's domain, thus angering him. He took pleasure in these killings because they allowed him to maintain his iron fist rule. Zeus was really pissed, yeah. This guy was cocky, and he punished him for cheating death twice. But his younger brother, Hades, caught wind of this and was like, no, 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 no. 
As a punishment for this trickery, Hades made Sisyphus roll a huge boulder endlessly up a steep hill forever. Yeah, he was like, no, 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 Zeus, I got this one. Brothers helping brothers. Hades then displayed his own cleverness by enchanting the boulder to rolling away from Sisyphus right before he reached the top, resulting in an eternity of getting jacked quads and hammies and an eternity of uselessly, effortlessly, and unending frustration. Yeah, that's really annoying. Number six. Hera and Io. Okay, so we're moving away from kind of firm but fair and non-lethals to a little bit more and more cruel. Io was a beautiful woman to whom Zeus fell in love with, a married man. Ugh. Io was the daughter of Inachus, one of the river gods and king of Argos. She was living in Argos when Hera learned about this secret relationship. And she was a little hurt. I mean, who wouldn't be? Stewing in her sinister revenge, Hera turned Io into a cow to keep her away from her husband. You know, pretty non-lethal. Very mean, but, you know, fair. After being cheated on again by the same woman, she was like, alright, I guess that didn't work. And Hera was like, I'm done. She then sent a giant gadfly to sting Io continuously in cow form until she ran away, mad cow style, wandering from country to country, always being stung. Okay, I get this. You want to stop hanging around my man? You get stung every time. Okay? Yeah. Bye bye <laughs> Number five. Scapism. Okay, halfway through, we're gonna we're gonna crank it up a little bit. You wanted it, here you go. It was first used in ancient Persia. Now the victim here would be stripped naked and they would be placed inside of two hollowed out tree trunks or sometimes in between two boats. They also called it boating in some references. Horrible. But only their heads and their hands and feet were exposed and you were literally stuck into this tree and if that wasn't uncomfortable already in the hot sun, you would then be force fed milk and honey until you were extremely ill to say, you know, the least of things everywhere. And of course, after all that happening in a tree trunk as time passes, bugs and maggots would eat away at the victim's flesh, causing infections and gangrene. It gets worse, believe it or not. The process here could take days or even weeks to kill the victim, and it's gonna suck the entire time. This method of punishment was meant to be slow and painful, and of course, in typical ancient fashion, it was very public, serving as a warning, of course, to others who may commit similar crimes. Yeah, don't do that, or else you'll end up uh, a tree, a big stinky, horrible tree. Yeah, let's go. What you get for stealing an apple, I guess. Number four, mozzatello. Sounds like a yummy cheese type, but it is not. No, not even close. Mozzatello was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the papal states for some of the most terrible crimes. You would hope, right? Basically, the person here who was being punished, they would be led to a scaffold that was located, of course, in the public square because, well, folks back then didn't have Netflix. They didn't have anything better to do, so they gathered the troops, headed for town, and they would watch people get punished and die all day. It was really brutal. Can't even watch myself get a needle and people are going to watch this shit. It's crazy. At this point, the accused would be accompanied by a priest and on the scaffold would lie a coffin and a masked scary executioner who was dressed in all black. A grim sight, really. Something you don't want to see walking up those steps at any day. A prayer would then be said for the soul of the condemned, which was ironic considering what they were about to do to another human being, because the executioner at that point would swing a mallet down on the head of the prisoner and sometimes, hopefully, this one blow would be enough to take your life but sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut, again, all in front of a public crowd. Yeah. Next video, we'll do nice castles or something. Top 10 cool medieval movies. Something less grim, maybe, for a change? Thanks. Number three, the choke pair. Also known as the pair of anguish. Both names are pretty horrible. This one here was a medieval punishment device used to humiliate victims. If you want to say that, it's not funny at all. It's actually terrifying. The device was inserted into the victim's mouth or sometimes other places. Use your imagination, it's pretty bad. And then this thing was slowly expanded using a screw-like mechanism until it reached full size. It would just go in and open up. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty horrible. It sounds like something from the Saw franchise, really. If I describe it anymore, I'm gonna be sick to my stomach. This tool, device, choky pair thing, at this point, it would cause immense pain and often resulted in permanent injury or obviously death, especially if it's in your mouth. Are you kidding me? The choke pair was also used to extract confessions from suspects or prisoners. Now, despite its gruesome nature, the choke pair remained in use for centuries and was only officially banned in the 19th century, which is far too recent for me. That's, people would 
Really? That recent? Okay. Today, examples of the device can be found in museums. So if you see something that looks like a, a weird looking metal pair, take a minute and reflect on these horrors. They used to punish men for homosexuality with this. Humans are disgusting. Number two, sensory deprivation. This one was a nightmare, but in a completely different way. Nothing's going in places or nothing's getting stretched apart. It was just you and your brain, which is sometimes bad enough. Now, typically you would confine the accused here in a dark soundproof cell, or you'd bind their eyes and ears shut. Terrible. The goal of this punishment was to induce a state of psychological distress into the victim. Now, the idea behind sensory deprivation was that without any external stimuli, the victim here would be forced to confront their own inner demons, their own thoughts and fears would drive them crazy, leading to this sort of mental breakdown, or ideally, for the prisoner's sake here, a confession. Again, even if it's false, just say something to get out of that room. It was also believed that this punishment would be less physically damaging than other forms of punishment, but just as effective, which I have to agree with. The victim would be kept in isolation for days or even sometimes weeks with zero light, no sound, and no human contact at all. The effects of sensory deprivation could be severe. They could include hallucinations, anxiety, depression, and even psychosis. Now, in some cases, victims never fully recovered from the experience. So whether it's a shoulder popped out or your mind, something's gonna break when you leave. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. You mentioned it in the last one and we have to talk about it now, I guess. This was a ritual method of punishment that was detailed in late Gaelic poetry. Now, in the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims here, they both happened to be members of the royal family, and they were both placed in the prone position, and they both had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool. And then, they both had their lungs um, pulled through said opening to create a sort of, uh, well, I guess, a pair of wings. How creative. Everyone's so creative these days, I guess, you know? It's like that TikTok. Everybody's so creative. We love a creative Viking. Both instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, both of them were accused of killing their own father. So, I don't know what's going on over there, but quite the daddy issues, it seems. Don't do any of that at any time, I guess. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? Like, back then, with your malnourished hands, your medieval hands, I can barely open a box of your in the morning. You're telling me some guy pulled ribs out? How strong must you be to pull? That's disgusting. We'll talk about that next time. Starting our list off at number 10, trial by elephants. Yeah, we'll start with animals. You know what? I love animals. Why not? First of all, I'm not sure if you've ever seen an elephant in real life before, but these things are mightier than you can ever imagine. They're gorgeous animals, but they're incredibly dangerous to be near. Their foot is like... It's massive, it's like a huge tree stump, it's insane. For this punishment, we have to head to a place, of course, where elephants can be found. That's probably a promising start. South and Southeast Asia. Elephants have been trained for years to trample the accused. Now, depending on which elephant you get in this horrible, horrible demise, they were trained to either get the job done fast or slow. Yeah, imagine an elephant getting the job done quickly. Sounds like something you'd never want to witness for yourself, right? Wrong. No, these punishments were all public. It was almost like a show, like ancient Romans Colosseum. We think of that and we think of lions and we're like, wow, that must have been terrifying. Yeah, imagine that, but now it's an elephant with a big floppy nose too, really loud. They're loud, that's a scary way to go. But at least that's a quick way to go, unlike this next one here. Number nine, drawing and quartering. You know you're screwed when there's an and, drawing and quartering. Wait, there's more. This is one of the most infamous methods of punishments. Now, this punishment was first doled out in England back in the 13th century. Now, the accused was, of course, as you'd guess, drawn or tied to a horse and then dwelt, dragged to the gallows. And then at that point, they would usually be hanged, maybe disemboweled, maybe beheaded, maybe be withered. I don't know, other words that start with B, that's pretty horrible. Afterwards, the guilty was, of course, as you guessed, quartered. In other words, he had his body split into different parts, you know. Some, sometimes each limb would be tied to a different horse and they'd have them run in different directions. It was creative, if I'm being honest, a little bit creative. The choreography, the timing here, it was impeccable. This punishment was reserved for those guilty of treason and was thankfully abolished back in 1867. So no more horses involved, poor animals. Number eight, strapado. Strapado sounds like an Italian artist. It's for sure not, it's definitely not an artist, no. It's creative, again, I'll admit, but in the worst ways. It's an uncomfortable form of punishment, unlike others on this list, it doesn't necessarily always end in death. In Strapado, the guilty is strung up by their wrists behind their head. Now, at first, this doesn't sound too bad, but 
again, just wait. The awkward angle is pretty much guaranteed to cause dislocation of the shoulders, but if that doesn't really kill you, weights may be added, and then at that point, your body's not gonna recover. Thought to have originated in medieval times, of course, always medieval times, could have guessed that one. During the Inquisition, Trapado has been used, sadly, into the 21st century. I don't know what they do in UFC, but there's probably a little bit of Trapado going on there. A little arm bar Trapado? No, no thanks. Number seven, heel hauling. As somebody who's not a fan of water, this type of punishment, I can't even imagine. I wouldn't even get on the boat to begin with. Already scary. It sounds like something from Game of Thrones, and it can vary depending on how bad the ocean or the boat is. Imagine that as a lead up. Yeah, the ocean looks pretty rough today. Maybe you'll make it. This punishment was reserved, of course, for sailors. Sailors at sea. A couple of naughty mateys. Now, it was first performed by the Dutch Navy back in the late 16th century, and what would happen was, while well, the accused, they would be tied with a rope and then dragged underwater from one end of a ship all the way to the other, around the rudder, around all that bad shit down there. And while many died, obviously, being flossed around a pirate ship covered in barnacles, it wasn't always fatal, if you can believe that. Not always, but a good amount of time, definitely. Yeah, you're not coming back from that. I can't even hold my breath for that long, no way. Number six, molten metal. I don't have to explain this one. This is, you've seen Game of Thrones. This is the worst. This should have been number one, maybe. I don't know, I'm guessing myself right now. This skin crawling punishment was a form of capital punishment because, well, yeah, there's no way you're gonna bounce back from this. While gruesome, this punishment has a fairly simple explanation. They would just pour molten metal or something extremely hot and not great down the accused throat. I'll, I'll tell you what, that's, that's probably gonna do the trick. At least it's gonna be fast, right? In Game of Thrones, it was pretty fast. There was like three minutes left in the episode. Guy did it, boom, roll credits. That's fine, that's a good way to go. Beats elephants, in my humble opinion. Usually during this punishment, they would do things to ensure that your throat would stay open during the pouring of the hot, hot metal. And to that I have to ask, does that even matter at this point? Put on my face, my back, my feet, either way, I'm faint and I'm not waking up. Sounds like that show Uh-Oh from the 90s. Just dumping things. I don't want anything dumped on me. Milk, molten metal, rats, nothing. In our number five spot today, we have the ducking stools. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century England in New England, and it was usually a punishment that was reserved for women. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly, whatever that is supposed to mean. Apparently, this included things like having an argument with their husband, fighting with the neighbors, gossiping, and backstabbing. Whoever made these rules had clearly never met a man, because newsflash, everyone does literally all of those things. But hey, Clearly the logic used in the past was not logical. Basically, this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again. This was actually a punishment method that didn't usually end up in death, but that sounds like the worst consolation prize of all time. In our number four spot today, we have trial by ordeal. This one is aptly named because it really was a whole entire ordeal and one that I'm sure absolutely none of us would have liked to have been a part of. This foolproof ancient judicial practice was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. Spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it makes absolutely zero sense. Basically, the accused would be placed in the center of everyone and they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. If they survived the pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, they were guilty. Like, what kind of insanity is that? Apparently, there were a multitude of different ordeals people could be subjected to, like cold water, hot water, hot iron, really whatever option, they were all bad. What an insane idea to test someone's innocence. I'm just saying. I know a lie detector test is only 80 to 90% accurate, but I'll take that over this ordeal. In our number three spot today, we have death by elephants. There's a lot of messed up punishments we've talked about, but this one makes me extra angry because why do we need to include poor innocent animals in our terrible behavior? You know what I mean? Execution by elephant was quite a popular method of capital punishment in certain parts of the world. The elephants would be used to crush, dismember, or or just inflict pain on captives who were being publicly executed. This method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use the elephants to signify both the ruler's power as well as their ability to control a wild animal. This practice began to die out in the 18th and 19th century as the parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in part because of their size and strength, but also because of their intelligence, domestic ability, and versatility. Although bears and lions were more popular used in other parts of the world, elephants had the ability to be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they are so 
smart. I feel bad for the people who died like this, but I also feel really bad for the elephants who were forced to take part as well. In our number two spot today, we have the breaking wheel. All right, folks, buckle up for this one that was once used as a method of capital punishment. This method was most commonly used in Europe from antiquity through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. This was a super simple device and it really was just a wheel, but it was absolutely terrible. There are two different methods with the breaking wheel. Either the person would be broken on the wheel or by the wheel. So basically, excuse the gruesome descriptions, but if you were broken by the wheel, basically you'd be placed belly down on a board and then the wheel was slammed down twice on each arm and leg and then on the spine. You'd then be tied to the wheel and hammered to a pole. The pole would be put up for the victim to be left up there to die. Yeah. I know I said it was gruesome and we still have another one to get through. Being broken on the wheel involved the limbs of the victim being tied to the wheel and then smashed with a club and in some places the wheel would spin just to add a little extra terribleness. The number and the sequence in which the smashes were distributed were not random however as they were actually determined in a court sentencing. Alright, let's keep going, we're almost done. In our number one spot today we have rats. Man, this one really sums up how terrible human beings can be. Rat torture originally originated in ancient Rome and ever since then it unfortunately has been a part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure being strapped to his abdomen or chest. Inside this enclosure there were rats which the strapped down person can feel walking around and this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically hot coals were usually placed on top which of course very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From here, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out because, just like us, they have survival instincts. The metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. Well, you see where this is going. I don't need to say more, but just know that it is very, very painful and very, very horrible. And to make matters worse, this is only one of the terrible rat punishments there have been throughout history. So maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about another one. How fun would that be? Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, and then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, 
I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five. Trial by ordeal. Trial by ordeal of water was insane. It's, it's honestly hilarious to think of. It was a medieval method of determining guilt or innocence. Now the accused would be thrown into a body of water, often a river or a pond, something dirty back then. And if they floated, well, it was believed that God was protecting them and that they were innocent. But if they sank, however, well, they were deemed guilty. They were naughty, right? This practice was based on the belief that water, being a pure element created by the Lord, would reject impurities such as sin. And it was also thought that drowning was an acceptable punishment for those who were deemed guilty because yeah sure the trial by ordeal of water was widely used throughout Europe during the Middle Ages and continued until the early modern period so yeah it lasted a while however it was eventually abolished due to its high mortality rate and well lack of reliability in determining guilt or innocence it was a bunch of bullshit who knew water rejects impurities that would be jarring we try and have a bath you just get launched out and you're like oh okay then gotcha heard number four the lead sprinkler the lead sprinkler device dates back to medieval times, as all these great gadgets do, and it was used as a form of punishment for those who committed crimes such as heresy or treason. The device consisted of a hollow metal sphere with a long handle. It looks like something you'd get from Elden Ring. It's like a weird looking wand, I don't know. It was then filled with molten lead or boiling oil. You already know where I'm going with this one. The Punisher would then hold the sphere over the victim's naked body, always naked, again, and then allow the hot liquid to drip through small holes onto your skin, causing severe burns and excruciating pain. Now, over time, variations of the lead sprinkler were developed, including ones with multiple spouts to, you know, increase the amount of liquid being poured onto victim or victims. Yeah, they got creative. Just the thing you want to hear in this kind of list. They, uh, they toyed around with some ideas, sure. Number three, the guillotine. A classic, not quite ancient, but we gotta mention it. First seen in France during the late 18th century as an alternative to other forms of capital punishment, all those other horrible versions. Those were seen as cruel and inhumane, but this one, dare I say, changed the game. It quickly became the preferred method of execution in France and was used extensively throughout the French Revolution to execute thousands of people, including King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. The guillotine's popularity spread throughout Europe with several countries adopting it as their primary means of capital punishment. They're like, hey, that looks pretty cheap and horrible. Let's do that. It continued to be used until the mid 20th century when most countries abolished capital punishment punishment altogether. Now, despite its gruesome reputation, some argue that the guillotine was a humane method of execution because it was quick and painless compared to the other nine that I've mentioned on this list. Oh my God. Number two, 
the thumb screw. This one, for some reason, this one hits me the most. Thumb screws were a method of inflicting pain by crushing the fingers or the toes or sometimes the knees. They would make massive thumb screws. Knee screws, almost. The victim's digits were inserted into the screw and then it was slowly tightened, causing, of course, excruciating pain and potentially permanent damage. This form of punishment was commonly used during medieval times, of course, and as means of extracting information. Yeah, if you do that to me, I, I'll say anything in four minutes or less. It was also seen during the Spanish Inquisition to force confessions from those suspected of heresy. Thumb screws were often made of iron or brass and could be adjusted to increase or decrease pressure on your body. Anywhere, like I said earlier, they would get creative with where they would put these screws of death. Not good. Despite its brutal nature, thumbscrew torture remained in use for centuries before eventually falling out of favor due to its, well, extreme cruelty. At what point do you decide, right? Like some guy's like, you know what? It's a little bit too much. Let's get this one. We're just gonna put them in the coffin for now. Thumb screws are so old. And finally, number one, cement shoes. We'll end on a 20th century mafia punishment because why not, all right? I wrote the thing. I can talk about what I want. Let's do it. You made it this far too. We'll end on a not horrible one. Cement shoes involved placing the victim's feet in, well, as you could guess, buckets filled with wet concrete, which then of course hardens around their feet. Science right there. That's how that works. Unless you have a moving truck thing, then that cement's gonna dry pretty fast. At that point, you're unable to move or escape and the victim is then thrown into a body of water to sink down and drown. This brutal technique was popularized by organized crime groups and mafias and stuff like that back in the early 20th century as a way to dispose of informants or those who had betrayed the group betrayed the mafia. The first recorded use of cement shoes was in New York City in 1935, when two victims were found dead with their feet encased in concrete. Yeah, new fear unlocked. I never knew, there we go. Now kicking off our list at number 10, the boot. Anything that starts with a the, it's bad news right there. Oversized boots made of iron or copper, these are a little different than Uggs, pay attention. These boots were often brazed onto the floor, so the accused, well, ideally they couldn't move around anywhere at all. Most of the time they were just sitting upright. They were stuck. It was welded to the ground. The boots at this time were filled with boiling water or molten lead, both pretty bad. And from that point on, well, it's not gonna be great. You're probably not gonna survive. Another medieval punishment involving boots, which is somehow worse, in my opinion, was first seen in Ireland. They were lightweight metal boots that were filled with water and then heated over a fire until the water was boiling as well as your feet. I don't know, comment down below, which is worse? To me, the second one is way worse. I don't like a slow boil, I don't like that. A watched pot never boils. Maybe that trick will work, who knows? Number nine, the instep borer. We'll start at the feet and we'll make our way up to the body. Why not? The instep borer was a medieval German punishment instrument. Again, quite creative, these medieval folks. This iron boot was much more mobile than the last pair of boots, that one for sure. See, this was just one shoe, rather. A shoe that hinged open to allow your foot to slide in. And then from then on out, just trouble. Slow chaos. A crank would protrude out of the top of the foot, and if you were to turn said crank slowly, well, on the inside of this iron shoe was a thick serrated iron blade, cutting deeper and deeper with each rotation of the crank. This location of this crank was purposeful because most of the time, the accused would bleed out fast. No recovering from that one. Still better than Uggs, in my opinion, but whatever. Number eight. Branks. Ah, the branks. Here we go. Sounds horrible. Branks were used to punish nagging wives or slandering wives or cursing wives or women who performed or practiced witchcraft. If you criticize Christianity, love it. But if you had an opinion or you can do math, you get the branks pretty much. It was horrible. A scold's bridle or branks, much more fun to say, was a device usually reserved for women. Yeah, classic medieval times history. It wasn't just a muzzle either. We always look at it as if it was a muzzle. No, it was a lot worse than that. It was a cage for the head with an iron plate projecting into the mouth, even pressing down on top of the tongue. More often than not, this plate was studded with spikes so that if the tongue moved at all, ergo, if you were to speak, it would cause you to bleed out. Now again, you can't open your mouth with this device, so that is double trouble. It was first seen in Scotland back in 1567 and later used in England. Branks were commonly used, again, on women of the lower classes whose speech was troublesome. Yeah, what does it even mean, right? Some shaped like an animal's head so you'd have a a cow for somebody that was considered lazy, a donkey for someone considered a fool, a hare for an eavesdropper, or a pig for a glutton. Yeah, God forbid you had an opinion in the dark ages. Number seven, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that one wasn't too comfortable to sit on. Just a chair of swords. The iron chair has spikes covering the back, all along the armrests, the seat, 
There's spikes, there's spikes everywhere. It's dangerous. 500 to 1500 rusty spikes on average per chair. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of welding work. Oh my gosh. The victim's wrists were tied to the chair, of course, because you'll want to get off of it immediately. Now that's bad enough, being stuck sitting on this chair, but some variants got creative and made it even somehow worse. Some variants of the iron chair had holes underneath the chair's bottom, and that's where red hot coals would be placed to cause you severe burns. It's like from Casino Royale, only a lot, lot worse. Sometimes weights would even be added, making matters much worse. Now this chair was meant to get a confession out of the accused because although it sounds quite fatal, no spikes could actually penetrate a vital organ and wounds were closed immediately by the spikes themselves. Sounds awful, but it wasn't the worst. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. You didn't die all the time. Number six, coffins. I'm not talking about, you know, these types of coffins with vampires like, you know, coffins you bury in the ground. That would be a bad way to go out, no doubt about it. But this coffin that I'm talking about, much, much worse. Here, the victim was placed up high, not down below. They were placed up high in a cage that was so small, you could barely fit inside of it. Stuck in one spot, usually with limbs sticking out. The live victim was most of the time left to starve or die of thirst or exposure. Yeah, those limbs sticking out, insects, the sun all day, it doesn't matter what you get at this point, but it's slow and it's gonna suck. And of course, in medieval fashion, it's gonna be quite public. Everyone's not working, no one has jobs in medieval times, we're all just watching some guy stuck in a cage, we're like, sure, this is it, we're living, UFC. Stand your ground until you can't anymore, the neck tower. This torture and execution was done in two ways, either in a tall, narrow tower or in a tall wooden frame box. Either way, both towers or a box could open only from the bottom side. A prisoner is put inside the wooden box frame or tower with only the neck protruding. Hands and feet would be shackled inside and only a towering pile of stones would be in there to stand on. However, each day, a stone or two is removed, dropping the prisoner lower and lower and lower by inches over the days, letting them die slowly by strangulation. Battle of the sexes with this torture, it's Zanzi, a form of crushing torture used to extract confessions or as a penalization for laws broken. Now may be a fun time to mention that the five laws of punishment I had just counted for you guys, those punishments actually only apply to men. For women, the five punishments are a different set and far less severe. First is grinding grain, second is the zanzi, which you're about to learn about, third punishment is beating, fourth is confinement, but also sometimes as mentioned, she got her womb smacked about a little, and finally five, permission to take your own life. Not them killing you or telling you to do, no, 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 no. This was some like side eye, well, we're not telling you what to do, but you know what's up, dot, dot, dot type of thing. Anyways, the Zanzi. This finger crusher was a Chinese instrument of torture consisting of small sticks strung together with cords, which was then placed around the fingers and gradually pulled, causing agonizing pain inwards. Think being tricked into playing knuckle breaker by your older brother for the first time. Under traditional Chinese law, a person could not be convicted of a crime unless they confessed. The Zanzi was a legal and non legal lethal torture method for forcing women to confess and for men there was a similar and more painful gun ankle crusher which uses three yard long wooden planks that slowly pulled and compressed the feet in an excruciating fashion that both broke tendon and bone. Time to snatch that waist ancient china style, the waist chop. Waist chopping first appeared in the Zhou dynasty and sadly no, it was not truly a plastic surgery alternative to get that slim thick summer look going. In reality, it's when a prisoner is tied to a table, whether lengthwise or widthwise, it doesn't matter. However, it's definitely far less comfortable to be chopped in half while also awkwardly dangling your arms and legs off of a table. Anyways, lying face down, the executioner was to try, try being the key word, to sever the person in half using a large fodder knife at the small of the back. These big ass knives were literally so heavy, it was more like teetering forward and letting the blade kind of slam into the person and hoping for the best. Sometimes most times the chopping was not limited to one blow. A story from 1734 describes Yu Hong Tu, the education administrator of Henan, was sentenced to a waist chop. After being cut into at the waist, he remained alive long enough to write the Chinese character Chen, which means cruel, seven times with his own blood before dying. After hearing this, the young Zheng Emperor abolished this form of execution. I guess maybe after learning what happened to Hong Tu, the Emperor felt like half the man he used to be too. Huh? 
Yeah. We've heard it. We've heard of it before. We'll hear of it again. It's Ling Chi, aka Slow Slicing, a regular torture and execution to reoccur in Bumblebee videos due to how far spread this torture traveled, how much it was used, and just how overall disturbing it is. Slow Slicing, also known as Death by a Thousand Cuts, was a form of torture and execution used in China from roughly 900 CE up until the practice ended around the early 1900s. The process involved tying the condemned prisoner to a wooden frame, usually in a public place. The flesh was then cut from the body in multiple slices in a process that was not specified in detail in Chinese law and therefore likely varied per empire or century. Generally it consists of cuts to the arms, then the legs and chest leading to the amputation of the limbs, followed by decapitation or a stab to the heart. If the criminal was less serious or the uh, executioner more merciful, the first cut would be to the throat. The punishment worked on three levels, as a form of public humiliation, as a slow and lingering death, and as a punishment after death. To be cut into pieces meant that the body of the victim was not whole in the spiritual life after death, which is massively consequential to many Chinese people who believed reincarnation required being whole in death. It is described as a fast process lasting no longer than 15 to 20 minutes. The coup de grace was all the more certain when the family could afford a bribe to have the stab to the heart inflicted first. Some emperors ordered three days of cutting, while others may have ordered specific tortures before the execution for a long longer execution. For example, records show that during Yan Chohan's execution, Yan was heard shouting for a half a day before his death. And finally, the nine degrees of punishment are ten shades of effed up. In the words of Mulan's Mushu, alright that's it, dishonor, dishonor on your whole family, make a note of this, dishonor on you, dishonor on your cow. Well the Qin Dynasty and a few others of China really felt this sentiment with their whole chest and it shows in the creation of the nine degrees. See the punishment in involved the execution of close and extended family members. These included the criminal's living parents, the criminal's living grandparents, any children the criminal may have over a certain age, which varied depending on the time period and who was in control and what their definition of a child even was. Also siblings and siblings-in-laws, uncles of the criminal as well as their spouses, and of course the criminal himself. Imagine messing up so bad your whole family line just gets annihilated. We all have that cousin or sibling who would have screwed all of us by now if this still happened. A famous documentation of the Nine Degrees is the story of Fang, a Confucian scholar famous for his loyalty to the Emperor Zhao Wen. When the Emperor is usurped and Fang is asked by the new one to write an inaugural address, well, Fang refuses. It's also ancient China, so realistically he knows exactly what refusal means so that proves how metal his decision was. Even when threatened with family extermination, Fang showed his IDGAF attitude and is reported saying never mind nine agnates, go ahead with ten. Blowing steam out the ears, the emperor says, bet. And so Fang becomes perhaps the only case of extermination of 10 agnates in the history of China. So quite literally, in addition to his own execution, the blood relations from all nine branches of his family hierarchy were killed. And as a kick to the nuts, his students and peers were added to be the 10th group. Random people unrelated to him who just happened to attend his lectures or work with the guy. Although altogether, 873 people are said to have been executed. Because this guy refused to write a speech and when threatened said, do it bro, I dare you. Before death, Fang was forced to watch his brother's execution and then Fang himself was executed by waist cutting. And legend goes that prior to his death, he dipped his finger in his own blood and wrote on the ground the Chinese character Kwan, which means upsurper. Man was petty until the end and took 873 people with him to prove it. Also, they liked writing in blood a lot. Imagine living somewhere where you could literally be asked, hey, uh, could you die over there, please? Called prohibition of death laws. They've shown up through history and around the world, and some argue that not much action is taken to enforce or punish violators, but that's because it'd be kind of hard, right? Well, this is the island of Delos, considered a holy site by the ancient Greeks. You can see the many of the old temples and statues that were erected in worship of the gods there. Check her out. She's a beaut, Clark. Classic architecture, clear teal waters, and dream vacay. No better place than to die.
why. Until the 6th century BC, when a whack job tyrant named Pisistrius ordered all of his soldiers, serfs, workers, whatever, to remove every dead body from the island as they had rendered it impure. Shovels in hands, they really did remove the dead bodies one by one until they felt they were all gone. I doubt you can actually remove all the dead bodies from any piece of land, but I imagine they probably got pretty damn close. And from there it became law in the Greek kingdom that it was illegal to die on the island of Delos. I guess if you drop dead, they just like leave a fine on your body, tuck it in your belt loop maybe, all saucy like, who knows. This wasn't the only place this happened though. Check out the coastal town of Le Lavador France. Sheesh, what is up with not being able to die in luxury? This is nice. Anyways, due to the disputes over the crowded cemeteries, ordinances to build new cemeteries, and conflicts with local environments and environmentalists, the mayor just tossed his hands up and said, you know what? If nobody can share, nobody gets any. And passed a law forbidding residents from dying. See guys, this is why we use our words and our listening ears. For everyone who makes fun of people's height, just know the courts will favor a short king. You should never make fun of someone for something they can't control, and height is a big one. Men especially face a lot of scrutiny and rejection for it, and we're at a point where nowadays, if you're literally 5'8", people will say you're short. Gentlemen, that is not the case. So, if you've ever been called short, listen to this. According to the 18 Laws of Kin, a set of legal codes written on bamboo slips that were unearthed in the Hubei province in 1975, during the Qin Dynasty of China, there was a law stipulating that men and women shorter than the height 1.52 meters do not have to bear any criminal responsibility for any crimes they committed. Apparently, this was because the household registration system, known as Hukoi today, was incomplete at the time, so it was often impossible to verify a person's age. So, the government used height. The founder of the Qin Dynasty himself, Qin Shi Huang, apparently only reached 1.5 meters tall, that's 5 feet, when he was 22. So he allegedly believed that his subjects could only be defined as adults once they grew taller than that. So yeah, short kings prevail. Nothing is more freaky than government mandated furry costumes. Europe really tried just about anything in the way of public shaming to air out someone's criminal history. Unlike China or Japan, which literally tattooed faces, the Ottomans who cut off hands, or even their European ancestors who chopped off noses and ears, the 17th and 18th century Europeans took a new tactic, shame masks. The uncomfortable apparel was made out of solid metal and would have been painful and super heavy when strapped tightly to your face. Naturally, it's abrasive, it's rusty, it's riddled with tetanus. But don't worry, there are lots of cool styles, like these jaunty pagan god looking dudes. As mentioned, there are these weird animal heads like medieval furry getup. This one's a rooster, and apparently to quote, those who were, well, the other name for a rooster, swaggering and vainglorious, would be forced to wear a rooster mask for hours, even a day. Which may not sound that bad, but again, chafy, hot, heavy cast iron, the pressure of which is on your scalp and your collarbones. And apart from these terrifying masks, criminals were given humiliating badges they had to wear for, yeah, rest of their life. Next up, we got the M&M's Trial by Ordeals. And by M&M, I mean medieval and Mesopotamia, not the M&M candy franchise out here trialing people by fire. And while I may be joking around, these trials were no joke. If you stole a bunch of crap and you were caught, they just hang you, no questions asked. But when ordeals are deemed appropriate for the crime committed, well, they weren't effing around. You were about to go through the holy test ringer, and your punishment it failed was excommunication from the church, because God clearly didn't believe in your good name. Kind of like a Mean Girls Regina George burn book. But that was just the beginning. There were three types of ordeals for medieval Europe. Being tossed in cold water, and if you think you're innocent, float you're guilty, makes sense. Hot water ordeal requires you to pick a stone from boiling water and heal from those burns in three days if you want to be innocent. And finally, hot iron, because being able to carry a pound of boiling iron meant you were righteous. Did literally anyone pass that? Meanwhile, trial and ordeal in Mesopotamia allowed the gods to decide criminal accusations, in which case I hope they all learned how to float or swim young because God came in the form of a rapid river. The law goes as follows, if anyone bring an accusation against a man, the accused go to the river and leaps in the river. If he sinks in the river, his accused shall take possession of his house. But if the river proves that the accused is not guilty and he escapes unhurt, then he who has brought the accusation shall be put to death and the guy who jumped in the river gets to take the house of the accused, accuser, whatever. So what I'm hearing is welcome everyone to Mesopotamia's favorite game show, Drown or Win a House, where contestants go before the court, their gods, and one rapid river to face off the ultimate test. Are they innocent or guilty? And now for a punishment I don't even want to know how they discovered, tickly lickly torture. Some names are misleading and others are quite on the nose. This is a beautiful middle ground of both. And so the victims are laid out in front of a goat, their feet are covered in salt water, goats love them salt and they love sodium, so they lick and lick and lick at the sole of his foot. 
And fun fact for you guys who aren't out here feeling goat tongues up often or haven't eaten manish water, they're pretty much like giant cat tongues. So rough that once the skin is pruny from a couple batches of the salt water and goat spit, the abrasive tongue will literally rip layers of skin off the foot. There's been cases of this method going so far that goat licked to expose the bones. The punishment was only ever rumored to be used in medieval France, and it's only ever described in a 1502 Italian document. Matsurushi is number five. The Japanese were incredibly determined to keep Christian colonialists out of their nation. They represented imperialism, and they were known to be dangerous outsiders, bringing foreign diseases and unnecessary wars in politics. Essentially, they didn't come quietly, they came quite noisily and bossily, and the Japanese just weren't feeling that. Now, the method they chose actually turned out to be incredibly effective and withheld Christianity from the country for far longer than many others had. This is because it was a wildly brutal method. Anatsurushi was used in the 17th century to coerce Christians to recant their faith after entering Japan. Victims would be hung upside down, suspended by their feet, and often lowered into a hole, itself often filled with excrement at the bottom. A cut would be made in the forehead or around the temple area in order to let the blood pressure decrease in the area around their head. The aim was to break their resolve, to renounce their faith, or they would eventually die. For this reason, one of their hands would be left free and exposed so they may signal upwards a willingness to recant. Both Japanese and Western Christians are known to have been submitted to this torture. Sometimes there was a doctor around just to resuscitate them so they can continue being tortured. They were also subjected to head down crucifixion and water crucifixion. Water style was carried out by putting an upside down cross at the shoreline low enough at the tide at low tide and waiting for the tide to rise so that the person would eventually drown. Christians were treated this way until 1873 when Christianity was finally allowed into Japan. And since we're already on the topic, number four is crucifixion. While it's unclear when crucifixion was introduced into Japan, likely 12th to 16th century, it had already had a 2000 year history when that when they did. So the Japanese added some of their own twists to it, as you heard previously with the mention of an upside down or a water crucifixion. It was one of the three executions reserved for the worst of offenders. Alongside beheading and hanging, sometimes the three punishments would be mixed and matched. For example, crimes against individuals of higher social status and against family members or one's master could result in beheading prior to crucifixion. Adultery, theft, and subterfuge are all crucible offenses as they threatened both the social and political order. The person to be crucified would be carried out on horseback nude, a lot adding to the humiliation of their sentence. He'd be poked and prodded with staffs by the assigned guards who would also carry a large banner with the person's name, offense, and punishment. Oh yeah, they aired your dirty laundry on the march to your grave. This route would also be set to pass the accused residence as well as the location of their crime scene. The accused was then tied at the execution site, and when the cross was risen and mounted with the accused tied upon it, the guards used their staffs to spear him repeatedly until a final thrust to the throat for an ending blow. The boiling point is number three. Large cauldrons were used by the Japanese for boiling fish to retrieve oil, preparing rice, soups, and cooking people alive. This particular torture was a remnant of the warring states period that I've mentioned to come before Tokugawa. They were completely masochismic in that time period. The Tokugawa Empire saw that and ended quite a few of these punishments because of it. But not at first. This is why I can tell you how the Tokugawa would fill these jumbo sized cauldrons with cold water and put it over over a blazing fire. As the water began to warm, the accused would be told, hop on in. What starts as an arguably nice toasty bath begins to boil. The accused is to remain in hot water until they confessed. Now, this was only used as an ordeal when the judge and jury were very convinced of a person's guilt, but the person just wasn't fessing up. It could sometimes also constitute as a mode of punishment or execution. For example, an entire family in the 16th century were boiled alive in a gigantic bathtub as a punishment for a failed assassination. Another fun ordeal was using a pan of boiling water and having the accused dip their arm into it. If they refused to do it, they were assumed guilty. If they didn't got burned, they were also assumed guilty. Only if you could stick your arm in boiling water and come out unscathed are you innocent, because that makes sense. Number two, we pull the saw, or don't. Don't will sound better in a second. So, like a few others on this list, the Tokugawa's let this torturous execution method from the past dynasty enter into theirs. However, they made some changes in the brutality of it. But before this change, this execution method allowed for an interactive experience. So, step right up, boys and girls. Who is twisted enough to slowly saw at the head of a man buried alive? In a book by Louis Freud regarding Japanese history, he describes the grisly execution of a samurai slash bounty 
hunter. The man had attempted to claim a bounty target, but missed his shot. While he had escaped, it wasn't for long. He was captured and identified, and he was sentenced to the pulling the saw. The man had been buried up to his neck, and a saw set up next to him, with the signboard inviting passerbys to cut at his neck, slowly hacking the men's head off alive. Now, traditionally, this saw is also placed close enough to the victim's throat that the accused, while buried alive, could make the decision to speed up the process if they really wanted to. But like I said, changes were made. Metal saws, they were replaced with bamboo ones, and rather than being used to actually saw off the living's heads as they once were, they were now simply put on public display next to the condemned person for periods of days prior to their execution by other means. And number one is the painful honor sapuku, which literally translates means self disembowelment. So before I unpack that statement, there are two forms of this execution, voluntary and obligatory. Voluntary is pretty rare. Circumstances such as warriors defeated in battle awaiting execution by their enemies and not wanting the dishonor of that. Meanwhile, obligatory seppuku refers to the method of capital punishment for samurai to spare them the disgrace of being beheaded by a common executioner. This form of execution was ritualized as a result. Great emphasis is put on the proper performance of the ritual. It's to be carried out in the presence of one or more witnesses sent by an authority who had ha issued the execution. While kneeling, the samurai would take a small dagger or short sword from a small table placed before him. The proper method, developed over several centuries, was plunging this weapon into your left abdomen, drawing the blade up laterally to the right, and then turning it upwards. A truly exemplary samurai would then remove the blade and push it into his sternum across the first cut and then up to pierce the throat. This is a brutally painful and extremely slow death to experience. Weirdly, for this twisted reason, it was favored by the warrior code used by the samurai as an effective way to demonstrate the courage, self-control, and strong resolve of the samurai and to prove the sincerity of purpose even when facing their own crimes. Women of the samurai class also committed ritual takings of lives, but instead of slicing the abdomen, they slashed their throat with a short sword or dagger. A little easier on the girlies, I guess. Number 10, Ray Romano. While listening to Ray Romano's voice for hours on end may be one of the harshest punishments ever conceived. Seriously, I wouldn't want to do that. What I was actually referring to was his portrayal of the woolly mammoth in Ice Age. Yes, the large tusk beast of the Forgotten Era. They were tough, and if cross would surely spell the end of any Neanderthal brave enough to face one alone. Which I'm sure at some point was. Cause trouble in the tribe? Well then you have to bring us dinner, and we're hungry so please go single handedly and hunt and bring back a woolly mammoth. I couldn't even imagine. Unfortunately for those Neanderthals, this isn't Star Wars and they weren't Boba Fett. Bringing back the head of a beast single handed wasn't going to happen. They were most likely going to get trampled and left for archaeologists left to find thousands of years later. Yeah, no thanks. Number 9. Cliff. While the Neanderthals might not have been as smart as their homo sapien counterparts, they were not exactly idiots. You find a high enough cliff and you push said banished member off the cliff. It's simple but effective. There's a good chance that whomever gets pushed off said cliff will not cause trouble for the tribe any longer. This is something that many civilizations would do for many years. The Greeks, the Romans, just about everyone really. You can't blame them either. It's cheap and quick, and if the cliff or ledge is high enough, you don't ever have to worry about cleaning up. Although I wouldn't do it in a pit like the Spartans, that would just fill up too quickly. And no shot that was the first time that Leonidas kicked a dude in the pit, let's be honest. Is there someone who empties the hole later? Cliffs are just easier. Just, just easier. Number 8, Ear Infections. Okay, not exactly a punishment, but it could be a punishment from up above. Hear me out. Not exactly sure who did this to the Neanderthals. Maybe it was God, maybe it was evolution, maybe it was something else. But the Neanderthals were cursed with something that I don't ever want to experience again. Shout out to the people who don't want to put their head underwater because after about 5 hours, the bonfire on the beach isn't so fun with your friends because you have an ear infection. Yes, that's right, ear infections. I'm sure I just described someone's least favorite summer night. Well, according to a study in 2019, ear infections were common in Neanderthals and may have ruined many meals by the fireside. While humans like us eventually grow out of them due to our ears insides growing larger as we grow older, the inside of Neanderthals ears stayed small and were a perfect place for bacteria. And like most folks, you're not you when you're hungry. You're also not you if you can't hear the arctic monkeys playing by the bonfire because of a really bad ear infection. Honestly, if you ever had one, I'm just sorry. Number 7. 
stick. This should come as no surprise, but a lot of problems or punishments were probably dealt with in the almighty stick. Cheap, somewhat effective, and in good supply. There's tons of expression for who's got the bigger stick, but like General Shepard from Modern Warfare 2 said, it also depends on who's swinging it. We'll never really know who was the first human-like creature to pick up a stick and wave it, but what we do know is that sticks are a part of everyday life, like tools and hunting. The sticks can also make for an excellent punishment delivering device. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but names can never hurt me. Well, maybe sometimes. Honestly, the only time I've ever been really hurt is when the world lost Harambe. Rest in peace, you silverback angel. <sighs> Life's never been the same since. Number six, rock. And you smell what the rock is cooking. Man, I miss the old rock. I miss the WWE. Those were just good times, weren't they? Stone Cold, too. What a great guy. Speaking of rocks. Probably the next best thing to a stick is a rock. Probably even cheaper and more plentiful than sticks. All kinds of punishments can be derived from rocks. Simple techniques such as having the tribe fill baskets full of rocks and then throw them at you until you're seeing stars or just ceasing to exist. Or in a similar situation, throwing someone off of a cliff, take a semi-large rock and drop it from a large height on top of somebody's head. Methods are different, however, it usually ends up in the same results. Just wait till they find out what kind of minerals and ores are hiding in those rocks. Oh, the discovery of metal and metalworking. Number five, tarring and feathering. Okay, we've all heard about this one. It's brutal, of course, but the most shocking part is how many steps this one involves. You know what I mean? Like you'd think at the feather part, one guy would be plucking, like, what are we doing? This is insane, I have to go home. This is, it's been hours here. This is horrible. This one goes as far back as 832 AD. This disgusting act has been going down for quite a while. Again, it's so many steps, this is horrible. Who invented this? A man stealing on trade journeys was to be tarred and feathered. This was for stealing during journeys Again, this is what I'm saying about steps here. First, you'd have to shave this Viking's head, which I don't know if you've seen a Viking recently, but that's gonna take a minute. A lot of hair, sure. Then said Viking was covered in tar and then duck feathers chucked on top. Then as if it couldn't get much worse, this poor guy covered in feathers and tar was forced to run between two lines of the men that he lived with and stole from. Now at that point, these other guys would throw stones, bricks, anything painful, you name it. Now anybody caught not throwing an object at the feathery fellow was liable to be fine. So I know it sucks, but grab something and grab it quick. If the thief did make it through this line alive, again, after being tarred and feathered, then he was off the hook from there on out. Then he was, I guess, innocent? I don't know, that's horrible. I, I wouldn't make that, no way. Number four, trial by ordeal. Quite the ordeal indeed. Look, I mentioned ordeal by fire earlier and that's quite a hot mess, but trial by ordeal is, I have no words. Humans are so stupid, honestly. Introduced after Christianity, wild. Trial by ordeal was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it made absolutely zero sense at all. Basically, the accused would be placed into the center of everybody, and then they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. Like, they all just beat this person up, it was horrible to say the least. If they survived all this pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, then they were guilty. Who thought, like who wrote the rule book on this? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of insanity is going on here? But wait, it gets even better. If their wounds were clean and without infection after three days, then they would be found innocent because it was a sign that the gods had intervened to show their innocence. So yeah, a lot of steps to be proven innocent. And healing apparently is one of them, who knew? Number three, no insults. Yeah, the YouTube comments section could take a, a note from this one. Here we go. No insults. Be nice. This one's pretty good. This would change the game today. If you hurled insults at somebody back in the Viking Age, well, they were entitled to compensation. And they could summon everybody else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, they could be like, hey, you hurt my feelings. Give me $10. I guess that is happening today, but on a much larger scale. Comedians, really. If you spoke bad about somebody during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation, right? And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages. Again, we see this happen today in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. It's, it's too late, right? You spoke it, now it's out there. 
you did it. Your reputation was how you gained employment, met friends. It was a really important thing back then, more important than now. Can't be messed with, especially if you're a Viking. Yeah, no way. Also, if you insulted one man, you insulted his entire family as well. You know, the whole Viking rule. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said them to him. So yeah, choose wisely, I guess, with your insults. Number two, rap battles. Before we get to our big bad number one spot on today's list, we have to mention the best part of Viking tradition, in my humble opinion. Battles, but with words, not with our fists, with our emotions. Flighting, or rap battles, or my favorite part of history, I would have killed it, honestly. I was writing some before lunch, and I think I'm okay. During those days, you needed ways to pass time, right? If you couldn't play hockey, and there weren't any villages to destroy, what does a Viking do? Why, you have loud poetry, that's what you do. Flighting comes from the old Norse flyta, meaning provocation. It's basically insult exchange, but make it theater. Now it's just... ASAP Rocky. Norse literature really has tales of their gods flighting. Imagine that, imagine how cool that would be. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya in some sort of rap circle, some cypher, that'd be amazing. The whole purpose here was not to see who could diss the other's hometown the hardest, but rather this was a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. It's all brains and no brawn. A little different than traditional Viking battles, right? In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast. Imagine that, you'd enjoy a roast while watching a roast in real life. Double the roast, double the fun. Later, this was of course entertainment in the 15th and 16th centuries in Scotland. But don't get it twisted, Viking flighting got pretty intense. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. This was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. Again, if you're eating food right now, maybe give it a break for a minute. I don't know, giving you a heads up. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, historically, who both happened to be members of the royal family, they were both in the prone position, right? So they would lie flat on their tummies, then they would have their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create the sort of like, um, what do you, wings, I guess. Just like a nice lungy pair of wings. We love a creative Viking, I guess. Now, both instances where this insane punishment is said to have went down, historically, both of them were accused of killing their own fathers, so. I don't know what was going on back then or who's doing what, but we've got some daddy issues that are not being handled well at all. So don't do that, I guess. Don't do any part of that at any time. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? I can barely carve a pumpkin in one go. You know what I mean? My wrist gets tired. I can't do that. That's a lot of work. Number 10, the rack. The rack was a punishment device, if you want to call it that, used during the medieval ages to punish and extract confessions from individuals accused of crimes. It was pretty brutal. It was like one to 10 real quick. This device here consisted of a rectangular frame with a roller at each end, and of course, a series of ropes or chains connecting to said rollers. The victim would then be laid on the rack with their hands and feet tied to the ropes or chains. You know where I'm going here, it's gonna suck. The rollers would then be turned, causing the victim's limbs to be stretched until they were eventually pulled out of their sockets. Yeah, the pain inflicted by the stretching was so excruciating and could cause, of course, severe injury, dislocation, or sometimes even death. The rack was a popular device used during medieval ages because it was highly effective at getting confessions. Yeah, true or false, they're probably gonna talk. They're gonna say something. However, because the victim was often left permanently disabled or disfigured as a result of the punishment, it was widely regarded as cruel and, you know, an inhumane practice. Yeah, you don't say. You can't just leave the guy's arm out of his socket because you got the truth. You can't do that, it's not fair. At least, you know, smack it back in or something. Let him go. Number nine, dunking. Dunking, also known as trial by water, but dunking sounds a bit more fun. It was a medieval method used to determine the guilt or innocence of a person accused of a crime. Again, zero to 10, real quick, this one. The accused would be bound and then lowered into a body of water, like a dirty river or a dirty pond or something gross and disgusting. It was the dark ages, right? Nothing, nothing was filtered back then. And they would be considered guilty if they sank, and they were innocent if they, well, survived and floated back to the top. The belief here was that the water here would judge you. Only the purest of souls would come out and live. But if you're not pure, say you're a witch, well, I, you're probably gonna drown, bad news. This practice was particularly prevalent in Europe during the Middle Ages, although it was used in other parts of the world. Dunking was often used for women accused of witchcraft or other crimes, and it was believed that the accused would be protected by God if they were truly innocent. Yeah. God's like, hey, stop drowning each other. I don't know, just an idea, maybe. That'll help. Number eight, the punishment of non-existence. This is one of my favorites. In ancient Rome, the punishment of non-existence was even worse than getting blocked today. Yeah, believe it or not, such a thing exists. Back then, they would punish the accused by erasing the memory of an individual or a group from history. 
Yeah, this was long form punishment here. This was done by destroying any and all physical evidence of their existence. Statues, inscriptions, and they would ban the use of their name. Yeah, you piss off the wrong pharaoh, now you're Voldemort. You're he who shall not be named now. We're not even gonna talk about you. That's how bad it's gonna be. It was typically used to punish individuals who had committed treason or other very serious crimes against the state, but could also be applied to those who were simply unpopular with the ruling class. Yeah, if you were a they just wiped you out from history. That ought to suck. Think of how many people we don't even know about today because of this punishment. It's weird when you think about it that way. Getting cancelled, but in ancient Rome. Brutal. The effectiveness of this one varied depending on the circumstances. See, in some cases, it succeeded in erasing all memory of the individual or group. While in other cases, it only generated more interest in them. They're like, oh, who's this bad boy who spoke back to a pharaoh? What a hero. This guy said it. We're all thinking it. And he said it. Follow. Ancient Egypt, we'll follow him on Egyptian Pharaoh Twitter. Number seven, drawn and quartered. Okay, this gets to the nitty gritty stuff, here we go. Last time I mentioned this while we were talking about another punishment, so I gotta give this more time. Drawing and quartering, <laughs> what does that mean? This one was a common penalty for men who were convicted of high treason in the Kingdom of England around 1352. And this one here is straight from Game of Thrones. It's pretty brutal, so if you're eating some noodles right now, just maybe put them to the side, give that a rest for a bit. Basically, whoever the convicted was, the person would be hanged, almost to the point of them losing their life, but not quite. Now from there, they would be disemboweled into four pieces. The arm, the leg, well five really, or the head, six. I don't know, I'm not good at math. Many pieces of you spread around. And because this simply wasn't enough for some insane reason, the pieces of you would then be displayed in prominent places across the country. Yeah, you see a torso and be like, oh, what's the story here? I wonder what he did. Must have been pretty bad. Number six, no insults. This one's great for YouTube today. No insults, keep the comment section clean, except the mustache, you can make fun of this. Go to town on this, honestly, I deserve it. If you hurled insults at somebody, they were entitled to compensation and they could summon everybody else around you at the time to be a witness. Yeah, medieval ages, they have nothing but word of mouth, so you gotta trust them. If you spoke bad of somebody during the Viking age, even if the person wasn't around at the time, you were just, you know, talking smack behind their Viking back, it could ruin their reputation. And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages that those words caused. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. Your reputation was really the only way you could gain employment back there. Only way you can meet friends. It was really the only important thing not to be messed with at the time. Also, if you insulted one man, insulted his entire family as well. And there were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said it to them. So yeah, sometimes you went a little too far spreading these lies, so they made it a cap punishment. Thou shalt not talk shittish. See ya. Number five, denailing. <sighs> okay. The forcible extraction of one's fingernails or toenails or both. Lovely. Hey, before we move on, let's give that thumbs up a click. Yeah, the little thumbnail right there that we see on the screen. Let's spread a little positivity into this list. I need it. I don't know. I feel like you need it as well. Thank you so much. Back to denailing. This was a favorite method of medieval punishment because, well, Sounds horrible, but it was easy. You just needed a really strong guy and some medieval pliers and, well, Bob's your uncle. You're getting the confession. A variant used in medieval Spain introduced a sharp wedge of wood underneath the flesh and in between the actual nail itself, which is horrible. The wedge was then slowly hammered into this grove more and more until the nail popped off. Yeah, thumbs up for thumbnails popping off in history. We try here on V. Number four, Dimnaccio ad bestias, also known as killing by wild animals. I'm a dog lover too, I can't read this one. Dimnaccio ad bestias was a form of Roman capital punishment in which the accused was killed by wild animals in the arena. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, oh, kind of similar to Gladiator and what they had to do. No, this was much sooner. This was a little different. This was 80 years sooner. Now, at this point, and Gladiator, they could defend themselves to some degree. Those meeting their fate with this method, they were always defenseless and sometimes tied to one spot. Or they were given a small weapon made of wood. It was an insult, really, no chance of surviving. This form of punishment was seen in ancient Rome starting around the second century BC, but 80 or so years later, the Colosseum then saw a similar practice. Only then it was public viewing, it was a big spectacle, it was a vent. And most importantly, gladiators could fight back with tridents or nets. Both are horrible. I'd rather just get it done with, to be honest. I'm not fighting a lion. No way. Look at me. I'm like 110 pounds soaking wet. I'm not gonna fight. I'll fight a zebra, maybe. I'll fight like an emu. I could probably take an emu. Number three, hanging. Again, a little straightforward, but I'll try and provide some history for this one. Sure, some hanging history. Okay, ugh. Hanging is quick. 
I mean, that's when it's supposed to be. Hanging can be one of two ways, suspension by the limbs as a form of punishment, or hanging by the neck as a form of capital punishment. We don't often think about the first version, being strung up by an arm, that's gotta suck, that's pretty uncomfortable. I can't even raise my arm in class for longer than five minutes, I gotta switch it up, know what I mean? The shoulders are weak. Strapado, oh, this would have been a nightmare. Strapado was the form in which your wrists were tied behind your head, eventually causing your shoulders to dislocate. I don't know what's worse out of all three of those. They all suck. I would do the get it done with, honestly. I don't wanna live for any of this. Number two, rats. If you're a rat lover, this one's gonna suck. I know some people have rats. They like to do tricks and crawl around their neck and in their mouths. That's cool. I'm not a rat guy myself, but don't knock it till I try it. Rat punishment originated in ancient Rome, and ever since then, it unfortunately has been part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments every era passed. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal bin or an enclosure, a bucket of some sort, strapped to his abdomen or his chest. Now inside this enclosure, there are rats, which the strapped down person can definitely feel walking and sniffing around on your bare skin. Now this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a bad hot environment for these rats inside. Now from here, these rats begin to panic, right? They frantically search for a way out, any way out, because like us, they have survival instincts. Metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. You can probably eat your Way through that. You can see where this is going and you probably just went <gasps> at your computer. Yeah, there we go. Now you get it. Let's move on. Poor rats as well, right? Like, come on, those little animals, they don't want to do that. They don't want to eat a six pack today. I don't want that. Finally, number one, the rack. The rack was a device that was made out of a wooden rectangle as a frame. You've probably seen this in Game of Thrones and that's about it. The person being punished here would have their limbs attached to the four sides with chains and then the people doing the punishing with the helps of rollers and pulleys and a couple of very strong, very strong guys, they would stretch out the person until either the limbs were torn clean off from the body or they got pulled out from their sockets and then couldn't be used anymore. As I'm saying this, I want to faint. This is so horrible. I said I felt lightheaded typing this up. This is really bad. Imagine Imagine being around in a time where people actually used to do this and you didn't just watch it on Game of Thrones for 12 bucks a month. And again, more often than not, it was public. So embarrassing watching your shoulder get popped out. You're like, oh, just stop. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have scaphism. All right, you guys, this one is also known as the boats or being eaten alive. And really, whatever way you swing it, it absolutely sucks so badly. This is an ancient method of execution that involved putting someone sandwiched between two boats stacked on top of one another. From here, they'll feed the person and cover them in milk and honey, and then they just leave them. From here, the substance is on and in the person will fester and attract bugs and other small vermin, which will then basically eat that person who can't fend for themselves alive. Not only would being eaten alive be one of the worst ways to go, but this process was in incredibly lengthy and ensured the person suffered for a really long time. Like, we're talking over 10 days here. In one of the first written mentions of scaphism, which comes from Plutarch in the life of Artaxerxes, while talking about the execution of Mithridates, he said, quote, when the man is manifestly dead, the uppermost boat being taken off, they find his flesh devoured and swarms of such noisome creatures preying upon and, as it were, growing to his inwards. In this way, Mithridates, after suffering for 17 days at last expired. So uh, yeah, anyway, if Plutarch wants to go pay for my therapy after that, I'd be really grateful. In our number nine spot today, we have drawn and quartered. This was a popular form of punishment and became the statutory penalty for men who were convicted of high treason in the Kingdom of England from 1352, although this form of punishment certainly existed well before that. Basically, whoever the convicted was, they would be secured to some sort of wooden panel and then drawn by horse to wherever this whole thing was going down. That wasn't said casually to make light of this horrible punishment, I'm just uncomfy, so I'm trying to keep it cool and casual. So once at the place of execution, the person would then be hanged, almost to the point of them losing their life, but from there, they would then be emasculated, for lack of a better term, disemboweled, beheaded, and then quartered, or chopped into four pieces. All right, and because this simply wasn't enough for some insane reason, the pieces would then be displayed 
in prominent places across the country. Like, no, I do not want to see someone's upper right quadrant while going for breakfast. I'll pass on that. Thank you so much though. In our number 8 spot today, we have Mazatello. This one was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the Papal States for only some of the most terrible crimes or crimes that were considered especially loathsome. Basically, the person who was being executed would be led to a scaffold that was located in the public square because they didn't have Netflix back then, so instead they just watched people die. I don't know, it was weird. I'll keep watching Ginny and Georgia instead. But anyway, the person would be accompanied by a priest, and on this scaffold would lie a coffin and a masked executioner who was dressed in black. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, and then when the time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Sometimes this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut. None of this sounds good. This one sucks so bad. I feel bad giving you guys this information. Next video, can it be like top 10 nice, cool, wonderful flowers or something instead? Top 10 dogs. Let's do that. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Blood Eagle. This messed up thing was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, who both happened to be members of the royal family, were placed in the prone position. They were laying flat on their tummies, they had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, and then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create a sort of super messed up and really scary and terrifying pair of wings. Both instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, the person was being punished for patricide or for killing their own father. So I guess definitely don't do that. I'm not really sure what the takeaway from this one is other than, wow, that sounds horrible and I'm really glad we don't do that anymore. I also really love my dad. In our number 6 spot today we have keel hauling. This is a word that I wish I could erase from my vocabulary as it has to do with one of the most terrible punishments I've ever heard of, but I mean I guess we've already talked about a bunch of these so I should be used to it by now. The word for this punishment comes from the Dutch word keelhalen, which apparently means to drag along the keel, and that is exactly what this terrible method was all about. This punishment was usually reserved for sailors, and they would be stripped, tied, and suspended by rope from the mast of the ship with weights tied to their legs. The rope would be looped beneath the ship so that once the tied up sailor is released, they'd be dragged under the keel of the ship. In the world of the most unsurprising news ever, this method had basically a 100% fatality rate. Wow, it's almost as if you put someone in that situation that threatens their life in multiple ways, they just might not survive. How strange. Imagine a time and a place where asking some folks, hey, you want to get dinner and drinks would get you executed. The Han food restrictions. The Han dynasty had some fickle little food laws and regulations, it appears, and for some reason they had wild punishments for them. For example, the law stipulates that dinner without a valid reason will be fined if caught, and if there's beef on the table, it will be cut directly. Does that do something to the beef? I don't get that part. I also don't get the part where between 206 BC and 220 CE, having a few drinks with the boys could get you literally decapitated. The law stated that if three or more people got together to drink, the participants would be fined four towels of gold. If you're unable to pay, obviously you face severe consequences because why can you afford to drink but not pay a fee? The only exception to this rule were gatherings such as weddings, funerals, and festivals. Many rulers and dynasties attempted to regulate the consumption of alcohol in some part because making alcohol required grains like rice, and that supply was often short. Rulers also feared that drunken civilians could easily turn disorderly and violent and cause some peace issues. Can't talk unusual and freaky without bringing up the Mongols and their Yasa law. The Yasa decrees are only available to us through secondary sources as there's no comprehensive Mongol scroll or codex found so far. Naturally, this can be problematic and our knowledge of Yasa law is nothing like the older code of Hammurabi. This is due to the fact they, well, they weren't literate. So yeah, the laws were told verbally. What we know of Yasa, declared by Genghis himself, is it concerned itself with people, not property, and aimed for three things. Obedience to Genghis Khan, a binding together of nomenclads, and merciless punishment of wrongdoing. Nowadays we've managed to collect some of their laws together and I'm going to read you some of this list. So we have urinating in water or ashes is punishable by death. One may not dip their hands into water and must instead use a vessel for drawing water. Probably a hygiene thing but at least it's not death, you know? It's forbidden to wash clothing until completely worn out. And don't forget when you do go to wash them, it's forbidden to bathe or wash garments in running water during thunder. I can't make sense of that one. And then also there's the one where parents can arrange a marriage between their children even if one or both are already dead. But the weirdest thing aren't even the articles, it's the penalties. Only death is ever specified as a consequence.
violence, adultery, death. Take someone against their will, death. Peeing in water, death. Don't answer con calls, death. Giving out food or clothing captives, death. Death, 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 death. Now, it also includes some pretty chill laws, like Genghis ordered that all religions to be respected and no preference be shown to any of them. So, I mean, you win some, you lose some. Up next is like country boys at Boots and Hearts. You gotta chug, chug, chug. This law and punishment comes to us from the Sui Dynasty of China, which the duration was 581 to 618 BC. If you've seen some of my videos about ancient China, you may know that getting into the royal court for work could be pretty blessed for you, your biddy, and any kids or family you have. Some parents went as far as to snip their kids' junk so they could potentially be a eunuch for their emperor in the future. If you don't want to do that, you could always take the imperial exam, the Keiju, which theoretically allows anyone in the country to become a government official. But failing the test was not without consequence, especially if you weren't neat. According to the Book of Soi, uh, the official historical records of the Soi dynasty, the law stipulated that examinees with bad handwriting would be punished by being forced to drink one shang of ink, aka a literal leader. Don't think you can drop out either once you learn that and you know you can't improve your handwriting in time. The penalty for dropping out is also to chug down some ink. Why so extreme over some exams? Well, exam and answers were in theory written by the emperor, even though in practice his officials would be the ones doing the grading. So even if the emperor didn't see it, bad handwriting indicated disrespect to him, the son of heaven. Also if you failed the examination, guess what your punishment is? Drink some more ink. Had to throw something violently nauseating in at the, on this list at some point, so we got death by Dumbo. This is gonna be rough, you guys, and it makes it obvious colonies of Asia were not effing around. Hope you're ready. So, elephants were used to crush and even gore criminals to death in medieval South and Southeast Asia. This method was popular in India from the Mughal period into the late 19th century. The criminals were laid down either face down, a blessing, I imagine, or face up to see their incoming demise, which was wild and angry elephants, who ran over them repeatedly, ensuring a quick yet very painful death. The most common form, however, was mano a mano. When a convict was laid down and an elephant walked over to the execution site by the handlers and deliberately made to stamp on the torso or head. Elephants are clever creatures, and reportedly they could be taught to slice and gore criminals to death with pointed blades fitted to their tusks. Imagine an elephant in a blind rage running at you with butcher knives duct taped to its tusks because that's literally what their last moments would have been. Like. All right, let's talk mud now. Not any old mud, it's mud, the glorious mud. Gonna say mud way too much, it's gonna feel made up. So, execution by suffocation was a common practice of the ancients. Look at hanging or wax stuff, like water torment. However, in the medieval period, a very strange kind of suffocation technique was used called mud, the glorious mud. And yes, you have to say it like that, so follow me on screen. Mud, the glorious mud. Yay! Okay, I'll stop. So, some historians tell us that criminals would be killed by throwing him or her into a pit of stinky mud, usually also packed with human filth and feces, because this is medieval Europe. The convict would either die by drowning or by suffocation, however, this was also a common accidental death for the exhausted armor laden soldiers laying injured on battlefields. Anyways, being drowned or suffocated in mud for punishment does seem to have been rare thankfully, primarily known to happen in the Burgundy region of France, where it was a punishment reserved specifically for women who left their husbands. Number 10, Judas Cradle. Right off the hop, we'll start with a bad one. I mean, they're all pretty bad, but this one is so specific, you know what I mean? This is a brutal torture device used in the medieval ages to punish those who were accused of adultery or blasphemy. Yeah, adultery. This is what would happen to you. Imagine this. The victim would be placed on top of a pyramid shaped seat, not really a seat at all, just a sharp pyramid, and they'd be slowly lowered onto it by ropes. Now, the pointed tip of said seat slash pyramid would penetrate their um, anything. Anything in this region at all, all bad, all rough time. And this, of course, would often lead to death due to infection. The Judas Cradle was painful, it was intimate, and it was slow, it was horrible. It was considered an effective way of obtaining confessions from suspects. Even if they were innocent, they're like, sure, I did it, get me off of this thing. What the fuck? This painful and gruesome method of punishment is thankfully no longer in use today, obviously, but occasionally I'm gonna pop up and remind you not to forget about it. It's horrible. The Justice Department has things to fix today, sure, I'll say that, but at least we're not lowering the accused onto the chair of death. Let's leave that one in the past. Number nine, the choke pair. Great name, already looking forward to this one. Also known as the Pair of Anguish, the Pair of Anguish was a medieval punishment device used to humiliate its victims, really. The device was inserted into the victim's mouth, or again, other places, and then slowly expanded open using a screw mechanism until it reached its full size. Yeah, almost like something from Saw, just like that, exactly. 
This caused immense pain and often resulted in permanent injury or, of course, as you can imagine, death. The choke pair was also used to extract confessions from suspects or prisoners. Despite its gruesome nature, the choke pair actually remained in use for centuries and was only officially banned in the 19th century. Yeah, you're like, what is this, ancient Egypt, Rome, Greek, what is this? No, it's like 200 years ago. Today, examples of the device can be found in museums. So if you see something that looks kind of like a choke pair, they're all fancy for some reason. Take a minute and reflect on these horrors. They used to punish men for homosexuality with a choke pair. Humans are disgusting. Number eight, scapism. First used in ancient Persia. The victim here would be stripped naked and placed inside of two hollowed out tree trunks or sometimes boats. But only their heads, hands, and feet were exposed. You were literally stuck in a tree. Now, if that's not already uncomfortable and haunting in the hot sun already, they would then be force fed honey and milk until they were extremely ill. And of course, all that happening in tight quarters inside of a tree trunk, well, as time passed, maggots would eat away at the victim's flesh, causing infections and gangrene. And also, it's horrible. It's so uncomfortable. The process could take days or even weeks to kill the victim. This method of punishment was meant to be slow and painful. And of course, the typical ancient fashion, it was very public. Everyone came out to watch, serving as a warning to others who may have committed similar crimes that somehow deserve being stuck in a tree. No way. Number seven, the punishment of non-existence. Ooh, this one's pretty good. It's different, but it's definitely worth a mention on our list today. When we talk about pharaohs or pretty much anything from ancient history, we know nothing. I mean, really, so many books destroyed, that much time passed. There's countless leaders that we know nothing of, and it has a little something to do with Donatio Memoria. Donatio Memoriae was a practice in ancient Rome that involved erasing the memory of an individual or group from history, just ever, gone. Control all, delete, see you later, Brad. This was done by destroying any and all physical evidence of their existence, such as statues or inscriptions, and banning the use of their name. That's incredible. It was typically used to punish individuals who had committed treason or other crimes against the state, but it could also be applied to those who were, well, simply unpopular with the ruling class. Yeah, getting canceled, but in ancient Rome, there we go. You guys scratching your face out of a rock. He's like, nah, you don't exist anymore, buddy. How's that sound? That's horrible. That is so, I mean, cutting to 2023 now. Yeah, they're gone. We have no idea who they are. The effectiveness of this varied depending on the circumstances. I mean, in some cases, it succeeded in erasing the memory or the group completely, while in others, it only generated more interest in them. Know what I mean? You cancel somebody now today and you're like, well, who are these people? What do they do? Today we do this, but it's just, you know, blocking somebody on socials. Mute. See ya. Number six, Iron Maiden. Great, now run to the hills. It's gonna be stuck in my head all day. Not bad, honestly not bad. Hit the thumbs up for the Iron Maiden band. Not for this content, just for the band. Iron Maidens were tricky. An Iron Maiden was a device used in the Middle Ages and it was an upright coffin shaped humanoid looking box with spikes on the inside that would puncture the victim when they were placed inside and had that big scary door closed. The spikes were long enough to cause significant pain and injury, but not long enough to kill the victim immediately. Ergo, horribleness. The victim would be left inside for hours or even days, slowly succumbing to their injuries and eventually dying from infection or, well, just blood loss. This method of punishment was considered uh, cruel due to its prolonged nature and the physical torment that it inflicted on the victim. Because yeah, even without the spikes inside, this one would drive me nuts. Oh, terrifying. It's like the movie Buried, but somehow worse. Number five, good soup. Perhaps we'll never know where any of these punishments truly come from, but like all things, they had to come from somewhere. Maybe they did come from Neanderthals. What I'm talking about here is boiling people alive in oil. Ah, <sighs> the good old days, which honestly sounds like the worst way to go. I, it just can't be nice. A practice that yet again was done all over. Giving people the lobster treatment must have been the worst looking, the worst sounding, and the worst smelling way to unalive someone. I happen to be a lover of theater, but man, this is a little too much. It's hard to call this anything but theatrics, as I'm sure there were much easier ways to achieve uh, certain goals. Honestly, you could probably cough on someone and would achieve the same result. Boy, am I thankful for sanitation. Number four, sacrifice. When your source of food gets taken away and then the rain doesn't stop for six days and six nights and when your favorite VHS no longer works, it can truly only be an act of God. We have to please him. Set a bunch of ooga booga men around the campfire. But how do we do this? Well, that's usually when the quiet person in the back speaks up. Sacrifice someone to the gods, he says. 
<laughs> All right, sounds good to me. This was something that went on in many cultures around the world, but it makes you wonder who really was the first to try it, or rather keep trying it. I mean, hey, the buffalo came back, the rain stopped, and I just found my favorite VHS. Dude, we gotta sacrifice more people. Number three, the brazen bull. This might be the oldest punishment on the books. It also may be the worst. Seriously, this, this one's the worst. Similar to boiling in oil, however, this is just, just much worse. The brazen bull, basically what you got here is a bull made of bronze, and she's hollowed out like one of those walker things from Star Wars, all the little stormtroopers in it. So you put the perpetrators inside, you lock them in, and then you start a fire underneath that would essentially cook your perps to well done. Make sure your perps are well oiled and salted. Keep on high heat until the screaming stops or the desired sin has been cooked away. Yeah, I can't even begin to imagine the horrible feeling that would be locked inside there. No amount of aloe vera could ever fix those burns. Number two, dishonored burial. You are born, you live, and then you pass away. That's life. You gotta make the best of it. And at the very end, the least you can hope for is that the people will love you and give you the proper send off that you deserve. This was a serious deal for those in the olden times. Every culture from every corner of the world has some sort of burial and ritual rites. However, imagine if you were the tribe's disgrace. Perhaps you ate all their food or never contributed to the tribe. Maybe you're the reason why my favorite VHS tape went missing. Well, sir or madam, for your crimes and disrespect against this tribe, when you pass on, you will not receive the proper burial rites. There's been a few cases of remains dug up different from others, which begs the question, what did the person do to deserve such dishonors? And what did they do with my favorite VHS tape? Number one, banishment. Hello darkness, my old friend. In the same way that most teenagers across the country feel when they discover hair dye, punk rock, and feelings, is probably the same way Neanderthals feel when they were banished from their homes. A simple plan, really. Non-violent, but quite effective. As you walked along the boulevard of broken dreams, you'd be searching for a new home in the brutal, cold, and scary world that was ye olde times. Not even your offspring will know you, as you may never return. Besides, you're in too deep, and you're trying to keep yourself alive with anything that you can find. The all-American rejected teenagers do this kind of isolation from the comfort of their warm, isolated bedrooms that are paid for by loving parents. The Neanderthals were serious, as leaving the safety of your numbers had many disadvantages. Not being eaten by a predator, for one. Stay strong, kids. Stay strong.